Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session uh, of this morning. Uh, the chair for the next session is uh, Professor Deva Prasad Maiti from IIT Gauhati. I'll hand it over to you, Deva Prasad. Okay, so we'll come all again in the uh, second session of the last day of this nice symposium. So in this session, we have two talks. Uh, the first talk, talk will be uh, by Umrada Samazdar from the University of Postdoc. And her title of the talk will be uh, Constraints on Neutron Star, Equation of State from Future Gravitational Observ Observations. So over to you, uh, Umrada. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so firstly, I thank the organizers for asking me to talk about my work today. Uh, I'll be uh, talking about constraints we can obtain from uh, observations of binary neutron star systems uh, from future gravitation wave detectors. And since I'll be talking about uh, data from the future gravitation wave detectors, uh, all my work is uh, relying on binary neutron star simulations. Uh, so moving on, uh, although we'd uh, all be excited to uh, see the science we can extract from future gravitation wave era, it'll be unfair to talk about uh, uh, what science we can extract uh, unless we also take into account the uh, challenges which we have to face from the data from the future generation. And uh, in particular, I'll be covering two uh, aspects of that today. So uh, one is overlapping signals in data. So uh, which is when uh, many signals enter the detector's band at the same time. And the second is systematics from incomplete modeling. And uh, this is also something specific to excuse me, uh, future generation as uh, the statistical noise uh, goes down and therefore the systematics uh, take dominance. And finally, I'll be talking about a technique to extract, uh, possibly extract, let's say, a quasi-universal relation from a uh, future gravitational wave uh, era. Uh, so uh, this is a schematic everyone is in the audience is for sure familiar with, but it's something I want to uh, show nonetheless. So uh, in addition to uh, bringing different uh, fields together uh, for gravitational wave astronomy, starting from uh, theoretical and numerical techniques to uh, experimental uh, techniques. Uh, when uh, a, a, sorry, a gravitational wave source uh, uh, consists of a neutron star, we need uh, further sophisticated models. Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, uh, we need more properties to describe uh, the neutron star. And uh, finally, uh, if, uh, if there are uh, unmodeled or, well, let's say unmodeled rather than mismodeled effects in the uh, signal, then uh, we may be biased in our estimates, but in particular with uh, several observations, we may also be combining results from individual observations and therefore uh, keep systematically uh, biasing our final results from the combined observations. Uh, now to uh, talk about the timeline, uh, which I uh, mean from future detectors. So uh, in this talk, I'll be focusing either on uh, future generation of the current ground based detectors. So the uh, next of which will be, is expected to start later this year, which is O4 or design sensitivity. And uh, then later, not shown in the slide, uh, I'll be uh, talking about also the envisaged third generation era, which is an Einstein telescope detector and uh, possibly two uh, cosmic explorer uh, like detectors in the US. And uh, uh, what we uh, see from the slide uh, from the left hand top is that as with uh, advancing runs, the detector not only uh, more detectors join, but uh, the individual detectors as they are now also uh, start seeing uh, into greater distances into the universe. So the numbers mentioned uh, in megaparsec in the, the figure on the left is the distance up to which uh, the, in the respective detectors can detect a binary neutron star source, which has a signal to noise ratio of eight. Uh, 
Um, so, and on the right is just a picture I found on the web for the locations of carbon detectors and some of the future detectors. So to begin with uh, the problem of overlapping signals. So uh, uh, here we focus on the third generation era, which is uh, we uh, place an Einstein telescope-like detector at the current uh, Virgo site in uh, Italy. And uh, we uh, place two cosmic explorer-like detectors at the current Hanford and Livingston site. And since we are interested only on detecting the intrinsic parameters which characterize the system, uh, the current loca the locations of the detectors are uh, not so important for us, which might change uh, in reality when they come up. So uh, in the third generation era, the detectors bandwidth will increase a lot uh, and they will uh, go up in the higher frequency range and go down in the lower frequency range. And while that means that several signals which are uh, now uh, not being detected uh, because of the sensitiveness to this frequency bands, the signals which are now being detected will enter the detector's band and even stay for much longer. And in addition, uh, what that means is for particularly uh, already long sources like binary neutron star sources, uh, that will stay in the detector's band longer and therefore uh, will have many overlapped signals. So unlike now, the detector's data will, uh, will almost always have a signal, but in addition, uh, have signals which uh, have, have more than one uh, gravitational wave signal. And uh, what we want to find is whether our current uh, parameter infrastructure, uh, parameter estimation infrastructure will be sufficient to detect such signals. Uh, so if I just move to the plot on the right. <clears throat> uh, so the upper and lower panels correspond to two sources. Uh, the upper one has an uh, signal to noise ratio of 30 and the lower one has a signal to noise ratio of 20. And uh, in both the panels, uh, the two signals uh, are overlapped, let's say. And uh, from the uh, keys, the TC refers to when the two signals uh, have the same marcher times. TC minus two is when the second signal ends two seconds earlier, whereas BNS is the signal in itself. So uh, this is like a reference curve. So uh, here there is no overlap and the signal simulates in itself to see what the estimates would have been like if, if, if the second signal weren't there. And we see that uh, broadly things are fine uh, until uh, the two signals merge at the same time. And we try to analyze the quieter signal which is the one in the uh, second panel. Uh, we show the results on uh, chart mass, the mass ratio, and the tidal deformability parameter here. So these are the three uh, parameters which uh, describe the intrinsic properties of the source, and we do not focus on the other parameters in this case. So in the case of uh, trying to analyze the quieter signal when both signals are present, we see that it uh, the our infrastructure ends up finding the louder signal in most cases. Uh, and uh, so the, the vertical lines are actually the injected values. So uh, they kind of act as uh, how, how good or bad our estimates are. Uh, now, uh, uh, on the one hand, we have looked at, a, at an extreme case. But uh, if, if I go to the table below, so these are the rate estimates we'd be seeing of uh, individual kinds of mergers. And uh, they are indeed pretty high. And uh, in our paper, we've also given uh, tables of uh, such rates uh, where indeed the mergers happen uh, very close to each other, which would be the case of TC here. And they're also fairly high, especially for BNS because of its uh, long duration. Um, 
Now, uh, to uh, summarize the challenge, uh, while in some cases it won't be an issue to uh, continue using our current parameter estimation infrastructure, at the same time, uh, what we use uh, Bayesian analysis to do our parameter estimation. And uh, at the very uh, uh, assumption for computing what is known as the likelihood is that we subtract one template like waveform from the signal. And that very assumption breaks down when there are uh, more than one signals in data. So it's not a surprise that uh, the current uh, infrastructure will have an issue. And uh, in, on top of that, there are other challenges. So one is uh, we have only considered two overlaps, where, whereas from the table, I showed them much more than that. And uh, so we, uh, we have not uh, investigated that. And the second is the presence of spins. Uh, we have also uh, focused only on non-spinning signals for uh, this work. But in reality, uh, there would be spins. And if there is precession, there would be modulation of the waveform from that itself. And there could be degeneracies between uh, that itself and uh, the, uh, the modulation from the overlap. I should also add that since we uh, had uh, this work, several other groups have also worked on the same topic. We've all found the same results, but uh, one of the groups, for instance, looked at uh, presence of spins. Uh, now uh, to move on to uh, estimating the tide, tides, let's say, from the binary transfer source. Uh, if you follow the schematic on the right, uh, when uh, two neutron stars in spiral around each other, the tidal force, uh, the tidal field of one uh, affects the other and induces a sort of quadruple moment. And uh, this, uh, the deformation from this quadruple moment gets imprinted on the emitted gravitational waveform, uh, particularly on the phasing. And uh, since in all our methods, uh, we uh, detect the phasing most accurately. Uh, in principle, if uh, this effect gets encoded in the phasing, we should be able to uh, extract it from the phase. Um, so uh, just to uh, quantify what I just said. So here, uh, I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, this is the expression of uh, a closed form expression of the waveform in frequency domain. And for a binary neutron star waveform, if we break up the phasing into components, uh, the first component we'll focus on is the point particle phasing. And this refers to the dynamics of the, uh, of the two components of the waveform when the two components are still sufficiently further apart. So at this stage, they do not affect each other because of their uh, matter and nature. And uh, therefore, the waveform here is same as that of uh, a binary, uh, as, as two-point particle binary black holes would behave when they are further apart. Uh, the next two are spin-dependent effects. And also for uh, this particular work, I focused on non-spinning waveforms. So I would not uh, talk about the spin-orbit coupling or the spin-spin coupling. But uh, finally, is the effect uh, specific to a system containing a neutron star, and that is the tidal phasing. So uh, this is the tidal description, and this is where the waveform knows uh, the tidal deformation of the neutron star from the field of the other. And uh, the question we want to ask is, do estimates of the tidal deformability, which is given by uh, this parameter lambda. <coughs> uh, the estimates of uh, this quantity change uh, when the in spiral dynamics are changed, but the tidal description is kept the same in the waveform. So uh, these are the expressions for uh, lambda and something called lambda tilde, which is uh, a linear combination of the two component uh, tidal deformabilities. And uh, this is given in terms of the component mass and the total mass and the component tidal deformabilities. And uh, in addition, 
uh, the reason measuring the tidal deformability is uh, important is that it is the parameter, the dependence of the tidal deformability on the mass is what specifies the neutron star equation of state. And as of uh, now, uh, there are several equations of state which are consistent with the observed data. Uh, whereas uh, in truth, there may be uh, one equation of state which all neutron stars follow universally. And uh, therefore measuring that is uh, something that's rather important. So uh, now uh, trying to answer our question. So uh, I'll, I'll just focus on the plots. So uh, these are the uh, these are the estimates of the tidal deformability parameter. Uh, and these are simulations done in design sensitivity of advanced LIGO and FORGO. And this is the, let's say, observing run, which is uh, expected to start later this year. And uh, the now famous source, uh, GW170817, which is the first binary neutron star source observed uh, by gra in gravitational waves. Uh, was uh, analyzed, uh, which is true for all gravitational wave sources being analyzed. It was also analyzed by uh, different waveform models with uh, differing uh, point particle as well as uh, tidal uh, dynamics. And they showed consistent uh, results uh, for uh, not just tidal deformity, but also other intrinsic parameters. But uh, we start seeing that this is no longer true in the future era. So the difference in the two plots is the left-hand uh, plot is uh, an equal mass system, whereas the right-hand is an unequal mass system. And the system simulated is actually what is uh, shown here as model two in, um, in red. And again, the, uh, the solid uh, black, Black line is the injected value. So while in the case of equal mass, uh, the second model, which has the same tidal description, but differ in the point particle values, while it also deviates slightly, this effect is more pronounced in the second case, uh, where when the sources are uh, non uh, uneven. And in that case, the, uh, the injected value, the, say the solid vertical line, uh, that is not recovered well. It, it's recovered to some extent because it's still included in the posterior probability distribution, but it is not uh, recovered robustly at all. Uh, so uh, also something we had, uh, and this is because of uh, the systematics from the unmodeled uh, higher order effects in the spiral dynamics. And this is, uh, as uh, I mentioned, for the binary neutron star source, which we had already seen 17 or 17. Uh, this was not the case, but this starts, uh, we start seeing this uh, with uh, simulations from the design sensitivity era. And this effect will uh, therefore get more pronounced if we continue using the same waveform models, but use more sensitive data, then this effect only will uh, continue to get more pronounced. Uh, now I come to the final part of my talk, which is uh, extracting a quasi-universal relation. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the equation of state is specified by knowing the tidal deformability and the mass of the neutron star. And the tidal field of one neutron star affects uh, the other uh, uh, and, uh, est uh, and deforms it. But in addition, a uh, neutron star, when it's spinning by itself, undergoes a deformation. And this is known as the spin-induced uh, quadrupole moment. And uh, this deformation is, uh, as I said, further represented by a quadrupole moment. And in 2013, Yagi and Yunus found that uh, despite uh, differences in equations of state, there are some relations which hold universally. and uh, so for instance, if uh, between two different equations of state, if we have a neutron star of the same mass, they will likely have different uh, numbers for uh, this tidal deformability. Uh, I always uh, represent uh, these with an index because uh, these quantities refer to 
the components of the system rather than the binary as a whole. But uh, some equations like this one here, which is between the spin induced water pool moment and the component uh, tidal deformability, they hold across uh, all equations of state uh, in spite of the difference in dependence of uh, the tidal deformability number and the particular mass of that neutron star. And uh, there are more uh, such quasi-universal relations. Uh, for instance, this one between moment of inertia and tidal deformability with differing coefficients, of course. So our, uh, uh, our aim here is twofold. So one is we want to verify the uh, yagi onus relation, which we uh, uh, consistently uh, employ in all gravitation wave analysis. And the other one is uh, we want to verify any quasi-universal relation. And for that, we just make up a relation where we uh, replace the spin-induced moment by half the values of what it would have been had the unit relation been followed. And we simulate several binary neutron star sources. And this time, we do it both in design sensitivity and third generation error. And instead of uh, using these, uh, uh, yes? Hello. So you have yeah. five minutes to go, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so instead of uh, following this relation to compute the spin-induced moment from the uh, deformabilities, we instead uh, independently uh, look for the spin-induced moments and lambdas. And then we try to see the best fit relation from uh, uh, the recovered quantities. Uh, so, Sorry. Um, to uh, start with the with simulating sources with the uh, yagi unus relation, so uh, we first simulate uh, sources in design sensitivity, uh, so left plot, and on the right plot, uh, uh, we have done the same simulations on in a third generation network. And for reference, we show the yagi unus relation as uh, the purple dashed line in both the curves. And in design sensitivity, we, we show only the prominent sources. Uh, we, we show prominently only the sources which are informative. And we define informative as uh, the one sigma uh, interval on uh, Q being uh, less than or equal to one. And the rest we show as faded, which are uh, either quite low SNR, uh, which quite low signal to noise ratio or a return almost the priors because these being component uh, uh, estimates, uh, these are not uh, very accurately measured. And we see that in design sensitivity. Uh, I, right. Sorry, yeah, someone, um, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, no problem. Uh, so we see that the prominent sources, however, are starting to lie close to the uh, yagi unus relation. But we can do somewhat better in the third generation network, where uh, we start seeing already that the error bars have shrunk considerably. And uh, that is uh, because of the improved sensitivities. And uh, we try to uh, fit a line in this case to our, let's say, best sources. And the fitted line is uh, shown in um, green. And uh, the residuals on that line are shown in dashed green. And to see if we can rule out the other relation, in this case, uh, the one we made up by having the values of uh, the Qs in the Yagionis relation, that's shown here in blue. We see that the residuals, excuse me, the fit, including the residuals, do exclude that line. And the fit itself lie, does not exactly follow the yagi unus line, but does uh, lie very close to it. Uh, in addition, for the best fit uh, relation, we have actually used a linear polynomial and not the four degree polynomial, because we have the same amount of data and we try to reduce the number of parameters we have to extract from the same amount of data. You can read up the uh, coefficient numbers we got. Uh, and uh, then we go on to repeat the same exercise where uh, we inject, let's say, or simulate the sources with the other quasi-universal relation. Uh, 
so our ad hoc relation, uh, which uh, in both these figures we show in, uh, as a blue, blue line. And uh, the for reference, again, we do show the yagi uh, relation also. It's, it's in purple in both the curves. Again, uh, this plot refers to design sensitivity uh, with the same convention for our uh, better sources or better and promising sources. And these sources indeed uh, do lie very close to the new uh, relation. And uh, in the third generation era, we see it follows the similar trends where also the uh, better sources uh, lie much closer to the, uh, to the simulated line. And uh, in addition, we can uh, try to fit a linear relation again. And uh, also this time, the fit, including both residuals, uh, do exclude the young units. Hello, relation. maybe you, 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 need, you need to wrap up. Sorry for this interruption. Yeah. But, uh, uh, no oh, problem. Okay, it's done. I'll, okay, I'll it's then done. just uh, leave you to read the summary <laughs> on your own. And uh, I'll stop. No, you can, you can take a minute uh, to summarize. Uh, Anurag, yeah. Please go. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, so, uh, mm, well, firstly, we've already seen some uh, constraints being provided with the current sources. But uh, with future detectors, uh, uh, while we will be extracting more signs, we also have to be cautious about uh, some uh, challenges, both in our infrastructure in uh, sampling as well as modeling. Uh, something I'd like to emphasize is I've been a bit conservative in uh, some of our results because it is not possible to use the actual uh, frequency bandwidth for the third generation era and have the runs completed. So uh, I have used uh, frequency sensitivities, uh, the, the lower and upper cutoff frequency, let's say, of the current generation detector. So in reality, the error bars and estimates will be even better in these cases, for instance. Uh, and uh, so lastly, uh, from the last work I showed, last bit of work, uh, the, we can look forward to future detectors to get further constraints. Um, I'll, I'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Anuradha, for this nice talk. So now this is open for questions. So if anyone wants to ask, please. Uh, okay, I see uh, Sajad. Hello, you can unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I just want to ask about this quasi universal relation. So if we consider the possibility of hadron quark phase transition, so what is going to happen with these relations? Can you comment on that? Uh, well, I don't specifically know about hadron quark uh, phase transitions, to be honest. But I do know that in case of phase transitions, uh, these relations, I hope you can still see me in the slides. Uh, these relations itself will uh, break down in that case. Uh, and that can happen also for, for, for instance, very high magnetic fields or uh, phase transitions. Uh, this I know, so that is possible, but I do not know about specific phase transitions. So, as I understand, I think um, mm -hmm. in some of the analysis regarding neutron stars, the LIGO data has, uh, LIGO has used this universal relation in some of the papers. So yes. That's why yes. I wanted to ask, so if there is a possibility of phase transition, so how long, uh, I mean, how valid is it to use these in the universal relation, is it? Well, as I said, there are limits in which this, these will break down. In addition, the LIGO-Virgo uh, data, uh, sorry, analysis also use these relations up to very high spins, which is also where these relations would likely not hold. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, I, I'm afraid uh, I, I do not know more than that. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so Prasad, I think Chandra Chandra has a question. Chandra, yes, 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 you can sorry. unmute and ask yes. your question, Chandra. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't see the hand uh, raised thing here. Okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so again, uh, Anuradha, this is related to the same slide. Um, mm -hmm. So, do you know, uh, there is a formal P and order at which these uh, relations will appear? I mean, I was wondering... Um, uh, well, relations in the sense, uh, this relation itself wouldn't, but I mean, for instance, the 
spin-induced moment formally enters in the 2pn order. Right, right, and right. The... And, and these are, uh, this lambdas that we see here, this is mm -hmm. the tidal parameter, right? I mean, uh, yes. Um, so this is like tidal deformations of a neutron star. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right? So, so, yeah, so I, I was wondering, like, you know, it is, is it the 2pn tidal deformation of a neutron star? So it's stronger than uh, the, the due to the companion is, is what we are talking? Uh, so the uh, this uh, this term, uh, this quantity, let's say, the spin induced moment, this is the term which enters at 2pn. This is also the, the spin squared. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. There was but, some. <laughs> Uh, but uh, these are the, the so the tidal polar polarizabilities and these enter at 5 pn uh, and uh, then uh, yeah five I think there's no 5.5 five, five six right but, but this enters at two and then I think there are higher orders at three and three point five right so uh, right so so there is a there is a there is an effect because of the companion uh, formally appearing at 5 pn and so on, but then these QIs will uh, themselves be appearing at 2 pn itself, right? So mm -hmm. yes. So we we are seeing these lambdas indirectly at 2 pn itself, right? So uh, this is the this uh, is the yes. effect we are talking, right? Uh, Yes, I I will still repeat what I think you said just to make sure. Sorry. Uh, so uh, so for instance, in the previous work, I talked only about the five pn effect, which is the right uh, the effect from the companion. Whereas here, I talk about both to some extent. One, this is uh, well, these are individual deformities, but in the phasing, we use also the uh, uh, the tidal uh, deformations from the companion, as well as uh, the spin-induced uh, moments, so from the self uh, deformation. But to some extent, since uh, in this uh, in the, uh, this expression, like I said, we independently vary q and lambda. So uh, we do in the two pn, we do not use this relation. So uh, yeah, I guess there it's slightly different from than what you're saying because uh, in the normally if we used this relation at two pn, so we just computed the q using this relation, then the lambda would directly come also into the two pn relation. Sorry, I won't be okay. Okay, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll follow up uh, later. Yeah, yeah maybe. I should, or I'm just Thank you. understanding. Can I Thank comment? <clears throat> yeah, okay. I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, just quick comments. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, on the right hand side of this quasi universal relation, this lambda i is purely from the 5 pn term and this q2 is from the 2 pn. So I think this uh, the lambda on the right hand side, it is not it, the only contribution is from the 5 pn here, as far as I know uh, about these universal relations. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Okay, so I think uh, we have to move on. So uh, let's thank the speaker uh, for this nice talk.